really happy to be back here again. Did I get this right? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Uh, really happy to be back here today. I have so far really enjoyed uh, uh, everything here going on at Shiner. I've uh, really come to uh, like and enjoy this place. And I just want to thank you all for being so welcoming to me and my family. That uh, well, I've been and I've visited many churches and uh, uh, while they're all welcoming to a degree, you guys truly are very welcoming, so uh, thank you. But I just want to remind everyone that at the end of the service last week, I actually uh, gave you guys a little bit of a challenge, all right? And now you're realizing that, oh man, I forgot, you're right? That's okay. But uh, something I love to do is I love to add practical bits of uh, help in my sermons, and I also love to do challenges every now and then. And last week, uh, we talked about the importance of our physical, or the uh, physical side of the church, how the church should physically love each other. And I challenged you, and I said, this week, find some sort of physical way to love someone at the church, whether that be inviting them over for dinner, writing them a card, giving them a phone call, helping them move like you all did for me yesterday, many of you. You've checked that off the box. But to find some kind of way to draw someone in and show them some physical love. And I also said that if you do it, I would love to hear about it because I think that we should celebrate that and we should be able to share the stories of the love going on here at the church. So if you didn't do that this past week, well, the good news is that, you know, the church is still here. We can still continue through with that. But uh, again, I want to thank you guys for coming here while we're going through this short little uh, three-week series that I call Doing Life Together, because I think that this is such an important topic and it seems really relevant to this church because you guys do really seem to be doing life together. And uh, there's two reasons why I've figured it out so far, why this church does life together. And the first one is because half of you literally are family here, and you don't have a choice, all right? So that's really easy. Um, but the second is just because you guys are serious about the church, and you guys are serious about what's going on here. And uh, I love that. <clears throat> One of the uh, darkest uh, spots for American history, um, there's, there's many of them and they keep happening, but no matter what you think, the Vietnam War was one of the really dark times uh, in American history. You know, no matter what you think or, or what uh, we believe, uh, we can't get over the fact that it was a dark time for the country, that there was a whole lot of bad going on. And uh, you know, many Americans lost their lives and it's specifically bad for a lot of those soldiers. So in this conflict, there were thousands upon thousands, even tens of thousands, some estimate, prisoners of war that were captured uh, during the conflict. And uh, if you didn't know today, believe it or not, they estimate that there's still around 2,500 U.S. soldiers still unaccounted for that were prisoners of war in the Vietnam War. But whenever the war was over, uh, the government got a large influx of prisoners that were returned home. Whenever the war was over and settled, and over the course of a few years, they got all sorts of Prisoners of war returned home. And so the CIA, they did their thing where they went and they, they broke down the numbers and they did a little bit of research trying to figure out exactly what was going on, how can we help uh, the country in the future and all that sort of stuff. And they had a really, really startling and surprising um, thing that they found whenever they started interviewing these soldiers. Turns out there was one factor, one thing, that more than doubled the survival chances of the soldiers that were prisoners of war in the Vietnam War. One factor of all the other things going on, of all the countless variables, there was one thing. And the one thing that mattered, and the one thing that doubled their chances of survival, and not to mention improved their ongoing long life, their longevity, and other health things. And it was when they were imprisoned, if they were imprisoned with other soldiers. That, that one factor that more than doubled their life expectancy when everything else was taken into account was were they prisoned with other soldiers? Were they there with people that they had friendships with? Was there people there that they were loyal to, that each other depended on, and that they needed? So this morning what we're going to do is talk about the importance of friendships. We're going to talk about the importance of the relational side of the Christian church. And I think that as we go through this, we're going to see how just having a normal little friendship, a normal little, hi, how are you today type thing, is not really good enough. And that we can be much deeper, much closer friends. And by the end of it, we're going to actually give a few ways on how we can become better friends with one another. So would you go ahead and pray with me as we open. My gracious Heavenly Father, 
I thank you for this morning and I thank you for this church. And I'm just thrilled to be up here and to share your message. As we get ready to talk about doing life together, I want to pray that the words I say this morning are not mine, but it's just you speaking through me and that your will and your message is accomplished this morning. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So going through this short series, we're inside the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, you're more than welcome to open it up. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2. And just a very quick little recap on what's going on is the church has just recently started. The church is young, but things are going relatively well for the church. And so at this point where we're reading, a lot of the rules and a lot of the standards for the Christian church have not yet been set. And so what we see sort of near the end of Acts chapter 2 are a lot of the foundational things, a lot of the building blocks for the Christian church. And so the things that we see that we're going to read now and even a few things, you know, previous and earlier verses than what we're going to read are some of, if not the most foundational things when it comes to actually having a church, actually having a body of Christians together. So we're going to go ahead and read Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 44, and we're going to finish up the chapter. <clears throat> All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. One of the undeniable aspects of the New Testament church is that they counted on their relationships with each other, with the fellow Christians. They considered the relational aspects of their church members, of the early Christians, as inseparable from the identity of that church. If you were to go and ask them, if you were to say, hey, we want to separate the early church and also all the friendships and all the relationships that you have within the church, they would have said, what are you talking about? You cannot separate those two things. So in that passage, we see that they did a few things together. We see they did things like they ate together. You know, they did break bread together, but then it, which is communion. But then it also points out that they ate together. They shared meals and time together. We see that they had glad and sincere hearts with one another. They didn't just see each other begrudgingly. You know, they, they weren't just the people that when you see them at the grocery store, they're like, oh, hey. They, they didn't do that. They were actually glad and sincere to be around one another. And it says that they enjoyed the company of one another. They brought life and they brought excitement and fulfillment and enjoyment out of each other's life. And friendship, of course, is just as important today as it was back then even though it was a couple thousand years ago. But if we're being honest, I think that for some reasons, we tend to have a more difficult time with friendships today than they did back then. And I, I know that's a bold statement, but I believe it's true. I think we have a harder time developing good, deep, strong, God-honoring friendships today than the early Christians did. Even though that's odd, because we have things, like we have cars, we can drive to each other's house. We have cell phones. You know, we have homes that are accommodating for um, friendships. But despite all these things, I think that we struggle with this. A, a recent study, a relatively recent study by Harvard in uh, 2018 found that one, more than one out of every three Americans struggle with being very lonely. Not just with loneliness to some degree, not just with occasional loneliness, but more than a third of Americans struggle with being very lonely. They feel as they have almost no good friends in their life. And in our country today, even though we have more tools, more opportunities to develop deep friendships, there is such an epidemic of loneliness between us. You know, mo I would say that 80% of us in here have social media, more than that have cell phones, but yet we have such this feeling of loneliness. And I call it an epidemic because not just spiritually and relationally friendships matter, but also physically. That same study found that, I'm going to read through these quickly, found that if you are very lonely, if you consider yourself to be a very lonely person, you are 26% more likely to die prematurely, you have significantly higher blood pressure, you have sustained adrenaline, which leads to early onset heart failure, you have average, higher than average cortisol levers, levels, you have significantly higher cholesterol, you have a weak immune system, you're going to have less healthy eating habits, and a drastically higher rates of severe diabetes. Friendship, and especially God-centered friendship, is a topic that really deserves our attention because we need it. 
And so this morning to accomplish this, um, we're going to go and we're going to dive into, um, in my opinion, the most interesting and maybe the most famous story of friendship in all of scripture. And that is the story of David and Jonathan. We're going to look at the story of David and Jonathan because I think out of their friendship and sort of surveying through a few different passages, we can find four different lessons on friendship that if we apply those, then I promise you it is going to help bring a fulfilling and God-honoring relationship with other Christians into your life. So if you want to flip there, we're going to go to the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going to flip through a few different chapters, so whenever you get there, you can just hold a, hold a thumb in the sheets. But we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 18 to start with. And the very first lesson that we learn about friendships is that great friendships require great commitment. So in 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his home family, return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. David and Jonathan made a commitment to each other in this moment. And in short, their commitment was basically to care for, to protect, and to be loyal to one another, no matter what happens. You know, and actually, if, if we happen to keep on reading, we'd find in the next couple verses that Jonathan ended up giving David his belt, his tunic, and a sword as a sign of this covenant. And that may, be seem, that may seem really weird to us. You guys would be a little freaked out if I said, hey, I'm your real friend. Here's my shirt and belt, by the way, right? But a, a good parallel would be like, is if we became good friends and I said, you know what, man? Here's a, here's a key to my house. Here's a garage door opener. And uh, here's the passcode for my phone, right? We're talking about that level of commitment with one another. And how are you? Yeah. Do you want to be my friend? We could be fr <laughs> I appreciate her greeting as a friend more than anyone else's. Yeah. So it would be like if we had shared that with one another. They did this. David and Jonathan made this commitment with one another because they knew that in order to have a strong and healthy relationship, they had to have some sort of commitment to one another. You know, one of the biggest signs, now this is, I know that this is a bold statement, one of the biggest signs, I believe, of the moral degradation of our society and our culture is uncommitted relationships. And I, I'm talking about this issue. We call it cohabitation. It's a fancy word for if you want to live together before you get married. Right? There's all sorts of people that want the benefits of a relationship, that want the benefits of a friendship, but they're unwilling to commit to one another for whatever reason. You know, and if you look at that, if you break it down, it usually doesn't work out. Long-term divorce rates of those couples are significantly higher. And as someone who has um, talked with and uh, known some couples and done a little bit of counseling with that before, it comes with such a smorgasbord of problems that you don't often see as much. And I think that there, there's a lot of reasons for this, but one of them is because there is no formal commitment in that relationship to one another. If we can stretch out this example to ourselves, whenever we have a relationship with one another, if we're not willing to actually commit and say, hey, I am your friend, I'm your loyal friend, then we have an easy out whenever things get tough. We can say, you know what, forget you, I'm done. You know, whenever we don't have some sort of agreement, even just saying the words that we're friends, it's easy to back out on one another. When it comes down to it, you just cannot overemphasize how important commitment to one another is. We've taken that for granted in our society and in our culture. And this leads us to our second lesson that I believe that we can learn from David and Jonathan. And it is this, that great friendship involves great risk. We're going to go to chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. If you didn't know, King Saul and David did not really see eye to eye. King Saul was a, not a fan of David's, and he tried to kill him multiple times. 
But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned David, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I, I think that Saul tried to kill David maybe around six times in, in these few chapters. And, and, you know, this was actually an awkward position for Jonathan. Jonathan was David's best friend, committed loyal friend, but he was also Saul, the king's son. This put David, or I'm sorry, Jonathan in a really awkward position. What was he to do? Well, he did not honor the, uh, the evil commands of a king. Instead, he honored his friendship, the commitment that he had to David. And what we see here is that Jonathan is such a good friend that he is willing to put the importance of the other person's well-being, of David's being, above his own. If Saul had found out at this point in the story that Jonathan had been trying to protect and help David, then Saul would have done who knows what to his own son. It's possible that he would have put his own son to death. At least he would have given him some sort of awful physical punishment. He would have been reprimanded harshly in that way. And Jonathan knew that. But he valued that friendship more than the risk that he took on. So in other words, a true friend, this type of a relationship that I think we should have with one another church, a true friend is someone who's willing to take on risk even to the point of death for another person, to look out for their friend. So a quick question for us is, what are we willing to sacrifice for each other? I know that I would give, I would go to the ends of the earth for my family, for my kids and all that stuff. But how loyal are we actually to our brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, many people say that real friendship, that having friends is too risky for them. You know, a lot of people don't want to risk anything. And, I, and to be honest, I can sympathize with that sentiment. You know, as someone who's, I've done, I've had various ministries now for 13 years, and uh, no one quite understands how lonely ministry is unless you've been there for a while. And taking on friends is, is risky. It's difficult because you don't want to be hurt over and over again. And I know that there's probably some of you here today that have been hurt by a friendship. You had a friend, you were committed to your friend, they were a best friend they, for years. You would have fought to the ends of the earth for that person. And then for some reason they turned around and they stabbed you in the back. That loyalty was not reciprocated. And if that's you, then I understand why you are afraid of that risk. I understand the risk, because it hurts physically, emotionally, even, even spiritually, it hurts. But I want to challenge you and say that real friendship requires some risk. But this is kind of how I say it. This is a little thought experiment, and it's not perfect, but stick with me. Let's say in this hypothetical world, I were going to say, hey, um, I'm going to give you some money. You don't have to do anything to earn it. The only thing that you have to do is you've got to walk through some kind of inner city, and you've got to hold the money out in front of you. Okay? Um, you know, somebody might take it from you, but, but they're not going to kill you, you know. I don't know what exactly will happen, but we'll see. You know, it's kind of risky to walk through, you know, big inner city. If I were to give you a $10 bill and you had to hold it out in front of you, that's a little bit risky, but, you know, maybe nobody will take a $10 bill. Maybe no one's willing to do anything crazy for 10 or maybe they are. Um, what if I gave you a $100 bill, Okay. And as long as you walk through the city real quick, you get to keep the $100. There's a little bit more risk. And now what if I say it's $1,000 or even a million? The risk goes up. But I don't believe that many of us in here would turn down the chance for that million dollars just at the risk of someone grabbing it out of our hands. And I think that even though it's not a perfect analogy, friendship is the same way. A lot of times we are so afraid of losing a friendship that we're never even willing to get one in the first place. We're afraid of that hurt. But I tell you this morning that you cannot throw away a life-changing and God-honoring friendship just because it might not pan out. Because even though other people sometimes hurt us, guess what? We mess up too and we hurt other people. And that's where forgiveness comes in. That's where grace comes in. And that's whenever we set aside our differences and we hug one another and say, sorry, 
but let's, let's reconcile this relationship. On to our third lesson about friendship. And this one may actually be a little controversial, but I'm, I'm going to stand by it, and I think that you'll, you'll see the point in a minute. But it's this. Great friendships involve God. There was a point in the friendship of David and Jonathan where they renewed their commitment to each other. In chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, follow this. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied. You are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. But here, pay attention to this. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, there is only one step between me and death. At this point, for their friendship to grow, they had to renew their relationship, but not just between each other, but they had to bring in the name of God. They had to bring in the name of the Lord. That's what it took for this friendship to continue to grow stronger. So now about this little um, controversy that I mentioned. I do believe it's true that great friendships require God. Now that being said, I'm not saying that there's never been a good friendship between two people who aren't Christians. I'm not saying that you can't have a good friend with someone who's a non-Christian. I'm not saying that those things don't exist. What I am saying is that any friendship that leaves out God is not as strong as it could be with God in the mix. And how do I know this? How do I know that all relationships need God? Well, it goes back near to the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. <clears throat> the Lord diagnosed this epidemic of loneliness himself, okay? The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God is the one who diagnosed the problem of loneliness and prescribed the need for relationships from the very beginning. And I'll make this point again. A friendship is basically only as strong as the glue that holds it together. Right? So I, one of my hobbies is I like woodworking. I'm not a great woodworker, but I enjoy making things out of wood. And a lot of the times there's, there comes a point in your woodworking where you have to join a couple boards together. You know, you've got to take two flat boards. You've got to plane them and smooth. You've got to glue two boards together. And there's a lot of different things that you could use. You could screw it in, which isn't really the best way to do it. You could uh, use super glue, which that might work a little bit. You could use resin, epoxy, which that kind of works. But you know, there's one, there's one really good way to join two pieces of wood together, and that's wood glue. You know, you, you smooth it down, you put a little dab of wood glue, and you spread it out, and then you clamp the wood together. And when you do that the right way, when you use that right glue, the wood is joined. And actually, the wood was not going to come apart at that break, the wood is going to split and break before that joint does. What stronger bond between people is there than God? God is the glue that your relationships need. We're still going to mess up. We're still going to mess our part up. I'm still going to accidentally stab someone in the back. I'm not going to do it on purpose. But our relationship, if it has God as the glue, is going to stay together, and we're going to be able to reconcile our differences. We're going to be able to forgive each other. We're going to be able to have grace, and we're going to be able to move past that into a relationship that honors God. Our last point this morning is this, our last lesson. And that is that great friendships reflect great love. Tragically, the friendship of David and Jonathan um, ended prematurely, and it did not end well. Flipping over to 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead on Mount Geboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Tal and his sons. And they killed his sons Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. Going over to 2 Samuel chapter 1, 
we see David's reaction at the news of his friend's death. Verse 11, then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son, Jonathan, and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. We see from this reaction of David that he was not just bothered by the passing of a friend. He did not just tear up a little bit, but he was deeply grieved and shaken to his core. The Hebrew language there is very intense, and it shows tremendous grief. And the reason is because his love for each other was great. You know, in fact, Scripture tells us that there's no greater love out there than that shown between friends. That's John 15, 13. That says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for a friend. It, you can judge the strength of a friendship or a relationship by looking at how much you love for and care one another. A truly great friendship, a truly great relationship with another Christian is one based in love and one based in genuine care and commitment to each other. And so as we're moving towards the end of the, the sermon, my, my question for the, the congregation this morning is, what kind of church do you want to be? What are you looking for here? Or really anywhere. It doesn't have anything to do with this building, with this um, institution. Are, are you looking for uh, you know, a social club? Are, are you looking for just a couple buddies? Are you looking for people to go out and meet with? Or are you looking for a deep, rewarding, God-honoring friendship that is going to stick with you for life? Are you looking to truly do life together with your fellow Christians? I don't know where all of you stand this morning, but I can tell you this, and that is that we need each other as Christians. I need you. You need the people sitting around you. We have to stick by each other. We have to be loyal. And that is part of what it means to be the church. That is part of what it means to be the body. It's part of what it means to be the bride of Christ here on earth. So if you want to do that, if you want to start investing in real life-changing relationships, then once again, I have a, a short challenge for you. And this one is a little easy, and a little easier than last week. It honestly may be a little bit more awkward, though. But I challenge you. It doesn't have to be someone that's here. It could just be another um, person that's out or another Christian that you're close with. But go to someone that you're friends with. Go to someone that is a, a good Christian brother or sister that you love for and care for. And don't let the awkwardness reach out, but simply reach out to someone and say something along these lines. Say, I love you, and I'm here for you, and I will be no matter what. Make that commitment to one another. Say that, hey, I'm going to love you, even though I'm not perfect, even though that I've messed up more than you have, even though there's nothing <laughs> redeeming about me, I love you and I care for you, and I want to be loyal to you. If each of you do this and mean it, then I guarantee you that this church body is going to quickly grow closer together. But you know what? There may be some of you here this morning that truly, truly want this. You really want real friendships. You really want real relationships with these other people that God has created. But there's a problem, and that is that you're on the outside looking in. You may not actually be here yet. You may not actually be a part of the church of God's family yet. If that describes you, then I have three promises for you. They're very short. God wants you to be a part of his family, and you are welcome. We want you to be a part of this family, and you are welcome. And the third is that you can do it today. You can get right with the Lord today. What I challenge you to do is if, if, you, want, if you want this type of relationship, if you want that, that friendship that only God and only the Holy Spirit can bring together, then I challenge you to come forward. 
And we do this not just because we're looking to receive something, but because we can look at ourselves and say, wow, I need some forgiveness. I need help. I cannot do life on my own. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, that do not let the pride of embarrassment or the pride of anything else stop you from coming forward and making that decision to make Jesus king of your life. All, all we have to do is step forward. We'll confess our sins. We'll repent. We'll obey a scripture in baptism. And then you'll be part of this family. What are you waiting for? Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, this morning, I just want to open up the invitation to anyone who needs to get right with you, Lord. Or who needs to get right with a brother or sister here. And God, just because this is the invitation time, this, just because this is the time where we're opening up the floor to people to come and be made right with you, it doesn't mean that we don't have a decision to make. Lord, sitting in the seats and the pews this morning, we each have a choice to make. Are we going to continue to follow you with all of our heart, soul, and mind? Are we going to continue to love our neighbor as ourself? Or are we going to take on to hold on to pride and are we going to live for ourselves? God, as we get ready to close, I ask and pray that you be with anyone here that needs to make any kind of decision. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.